Hello, everyone. Hello, people here at McNally Robinson and people at home. My name's Mark, and my guest tonight, a hear from Music Talk from McNally, is Danook Widgeretten. Danook, welcome to Saskatoon. Thank you so much for having me. Have you been to Saskatoon before? I have once. It's oh. probably been about a decade. Okay. I was here to do a, a project with the Wind Ensemble. Yes, with Darren yeah, Olerking. With Invisible Cities. Yes, yeah. of yeah. course. I, I was there. I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> there you go. And that piece is still ticking along. Yes. Yeah. 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 Done quite often. Yeah. Just had a redo, didn't it? An orchestral version. Yeah. 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 So well. I'm hoping to see Darren soon. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, then we'll have to we'll have to do it here now. Okay. Bring it back. <laughs> bring it back to life. <laughs> make it full circle. Uh, it is such a thrill to have you here. We were just talking before this that um, you and I first started talking about this concert <laughs> in 2019. Oh, yes. Um, uh, in the before yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that, whatever the before times means to us anymore. Um, but I actually remember meeting you and hearing you speak in, in I think it was 2011. Like that's a long time ago in Nova mm -hmm. Scotia a and being inspired by you. And I remember actually watching you perform a few years ago. Gosh, this is a long time ago as well with Keenan. Uh, me. Yeah, and yeah. In, in Toronto. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's actually coming. He's here next season with us. Oh, great. Doing his um, his suite for improviser. Oh, orchestra. good. Yes. Good. So that'll be lots of fun. Yeah. Um, uh, so on, on top of on top of loving your work, I've been a huge fan of yours for many years. So it's thrilling to have you here, not just on the podium. You're you're pulling double duty this week because you also <laughs> composed one of the pieces. Yes. The Tabla Concerto. You have such a fascinating musical life um uh and uh you know the in some of the media that went out this week about you were born in sri lanka raised in dubai trained in new york and england and somehow landed yourself in canada mm -hmm. it's cold here I, I, good for you <laughs> <laughs> good. i hibernate in we, the winter i was gonna say yeah. you're, you uh, you also live in ottawa which yeah. is which is very yeah. cold yeah. uh yeah not quite prairie cold but yeah um uh fascinating fascinating musical uh history to you mm -hmm. um What's that like? What's it? What's it? What's you know, what was it like to to be able to you know? Be, I mean, I w I was thinking about being raised in Dubai before it was the Dubai we know it to be now. Exactly. Because uh, uh, now it's it's like it's very different. Very, yeah. <laughs> very different. Yeah. It, I I feel very blessed to have grown up in Dubai at that time, uh, and you know when there was a lot of that, uh, you could really sort of feel the fact that there was a lot of Arab culture and it was a melting pot in uh, of South Asian culture as well. And so what I didn't realize was that sort of growing up there musically, and, and I should say that you didn't really have access to a lot of things that kids would have, you know, you couldn't just join a youth orchestra if you wanted to, that kind of thing. There would be maybe one concert a semester that you would definitely go to, you know, to hear music. So I would spend all my pocket money on, you know, music magazines and, and, and recordings and things, right? There was, it was just pre-internet. And, um, but what I didn't realize was while I was having a Western education at a very good school that offered music, all of the sounds of the Middle East and South Asian music were really going in here. And, and what happens is then when you move away from that place, I it starts to come out. And if you're an artist, you want to engage with it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I it is, I mean, it is fascinating how Dubai, you know, even, even more of a, of a melting pot now. Mm -hmm. Because it's become such an international uh, a hotbed. I, I have a friend currently moving there. Actually, uh, right. it's 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 fascinating how uh, the history of that city alone um, is sort of changing the it world. It changes so rapidly. Yeah. It it is possibly the most multicultural city in the world, like Toronto, yeah. and and I think that that really made an imprint. You know, um, so if music was challenging to seek out. How did you st how, how how did you end up in this wonderful career? What what was the is there a moment that you you can pinpoint and go this is where you went oh I want to do this? Oh yeah, I, it was when I heard Mozart's music for the first time, and that was because I bought a recording. I think because I liked the way the cover looked. That's it. Yeah. You know because you I should judge a, a CD by exactly, its cover. Exactly, you yeah. Yeah. should. Yeah. Um, and and I think again that was because no one was telling me well you should be listening to this or that, which was actually an advantage, right? No one was curating my musical selections, and um, you know my my mother's a d retired dancer and my my father, uh, you know he plays uh, pretty good jazz piano by ear and everything. So they had a collection, and I would just kind of pick things off the shelves, and you know one day it would be Sri Lankan traditional music or Miles Davis or Mozart or something, right? But then I, but I bought this recording because I liked the look of the, the cover, and I remember listening to it, 
and there was just that moment, you know, like you hear the, uh, it was a piano concerto, and you and you and you hear the orchestra set up the soloist, the soloist, soloist comes in, and at that moment I just thought, this is just miraculous, and um, whatever this is, I want to be closer to it, and about that time, uh, there was a music class at my school where the, the context of how people were creating these pieces came up. Mm -hmm. And that really helped. You know, it wasn't just sound, but there was some context. And then I started geeking out about the history of these things. Um, and and that, that was it. I just started dabbling in composition and still playing piano and that kind of thing. Very cool. And, 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 then, you and then you took off. Yeah, and I actually, sorry, I always say that that was probably my first spiritual experience before I knew what religion was, mm -hmm. you know, and I think music has that power, yes. right? Like you, you feel that this is something spiritual, yeah. and, uh, you know, even though you're age 12, like you, you, you know it's some kind of non-material experience, right? Yeah, it is, it is a, it's a, uh, and a universal experience. Mm -hmm. um, I always am fascinated that we can all sit in a room together and experience the same thing, but have such deep personal journeys that, exactly. that you know, the person beside you who, heard, who experienced and heard the same things you did, experienced it in, in their own personal way. This, this, the the, the um, personal universality of it, which is fascinating. Exactly, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, and it is funny, I mean, a lot, I, spiritual experiences in concerts, I mean, that, that is, that's been a, Major major selling point since Hildegard. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's, uh, I actually had many many years ago. I produced a concert uh, with uh, Jan Leschetsky, mm -hmm. pianist, and and uh, uh, there was a, a a nun from here in town who afterwards said to me uh, that that during one of his performances that night, it that was one of the biggest spiritual experiences of her life, um, which was yeah, you know, yeah. like uh, for everyone, it's such an incredible experience. Um, what? then took you from, like, how did you get involved in composition? W was there opportunities for you to compose as a young person? Was that something that just came to you after you, you know, a I mean, a lot of people come to composition in university. Yeah, I was very lucky. I had uh, teachers who encouraged me. Um, none of them were composers, but they said, you know, this is sort of how you do it. Yeah. Just go for it. And and uh, I was, I, you know, I loved That's kind of... probably the best actual way to start. Uh, yeah, I, I just, you know, I l and I love sort of throwing myself into sort of uncomfortable artistic <laughs> situations like that. So I just started dabbling and, and of course it was like like tenth rate Mozart to begin with. And then you and then you meet friends who would like to play your stuff. You start writing for them. And I was just lucky that I got to do it for a long time. And then I, I went to the UK to, to study it formally. Yeah. yeah. And 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 the rest as they say is history. Mm -hmm. you you have a huge output of, of music. Um, uh, and and uh, in in pretty much every genre, I would say so, except opera. You I was going to say yeah. you don't yet have. I an don't opera. think I have an opera in me in this lifetime, just because it's so exhausting. It's so much work. Yeah, yeah, it's too much work. Unless it's absurd. Yeah, it's <laughs> so much work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or or uh, as we all say in the industry, unless you get a grant, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and then if you get the grant, then you've got an opera in you, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, uh, this tabla concerto, um, it brings all sorts of of your own uh, uniqueness to it because you were able to write for classical orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, orchestra is is you know um, uh, orchestras as we know them very European. There, I mm -hmm. mean, there are other versions of, of large music ensembles, which we sort of call orchestras now, um, and, and existed throughout the world even long before y Europeans were doing their orchestras. Um, but you have you were able to actually use those textures, those colors, and, and insert tabla, which is not an instrument that is found in a European orchestra. Exactly, and that was a deliberate choice. You know, the only non-Western instrument on the stage is the tabla. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it was a choice to showcase the tabla with another favorite instrument, which yeah. is the Western Classical Orchestra. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so our audiences heard your music first a few years ago. We did Yatra, mm -hmm. uh, which was such a phenomenal hit, and, and that was actually one of the reasons I was like, okay, we got it, we got to do more. Um, uh, tell us about, about this, this concerto. It's, it's fascinating because it tells stories. Now, you know, all music tells a story, and you don't necessarily need to know the story to, to experience the story. That's a very good point. And I yeah. actually think that is one of the brilliant things that you've achieved in this piece. Um, well, it, it actually doesn't have a story, which is a very good point, you know. Um, however, I think, and increasingly I find this, like, you know, if you want 
at, thi at this point in my life, you know, I have very little time. So if I take on a project and I want to write a piece of music, it has to really have a sharp perspective and it has to be clear. And, and I think um, with the Thubla Concerto, it, it took 10 years uh, from the time I had the idea, which was sort of sitting with a Thubla player friend in a, in a, you know, in a coffee shop in New York where uh, I just said, wouldn't it be amazing to, to hear your instrument in front of the sound of a Western classical orchestra? And that was it. And then, then you just wait, and you know, it just sort of goes. The, the the idea goes into a drawer or something. And then you have to, you know, it. I came to a different country, met a met an orchestra, met a fantastic conductor, got the funding. You know, it took all that time. And then so it was premiered in 2012, and and so you know the the I I I, I mean I say this in in all honesty i never expected the piece to have the success it has had right mm -hmm. so it's it's still it's being played several times a year all over the world yeah all over the world yeah. and and i think I it was uh, probably just because i took a long time thinking about it and i just thought well um, if you have a you know a western classical concerto um, you uh, you come to a violin concerto and you ex expect to hear say three movements or something could you have three perspectives of thubla, right? So no narrative per se, but three right. different perspectives right. of an instrument that is so rich, right. it gives itself to multiple perspectives, right? So, so you would need several thubla concertos to, uh, to, to, to really even scratch the surface of right. the richness of the instrument. Yeah. Um, so my perspectives were, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in just random order, the last movement is for me, uh, the a representation of what happens in a traditional Indian classical tabla recital, where they where they speak the compositions, right? right? They recite the compositions. So all the compositions have a sort of onomatopoeic yeah. sound, and that's very exciting. It always, you know, it's the part of the recording I always skip to. Much cooler solfege. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for the music geeks in the room <laughs> exactly, or at home, exactly. This is much cooler than solfege. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. um, and so, so I I thought, okay, that that's going to go in there. And then the second movement is uh, the, the tabla you hear as accompanist to non-classical Indian music, meaning mm -hmm. folk music, mm -hmm. right? So the tabla is actually used as a sort of uh, gentle accompanist for beautiful songs and, you know, uh, songs about love and all, 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 all of these things, right? And so there's this sort of little depiction of that in the slow movement. And then in the first movement, it's the tabla that you've heard if you didn't know it was tabla. So the samples of tabla you hear in a movie soundtrack or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and so the first movement is this very curious stew of all these influences. You get sort of like sounds of Western Baroque colliding with, you know, like drum and bass. Yep. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think the tabla is able to sort of coexist in all of these uh, contexts. And that's what I love about the instrument. And I've just been fortunate to meet amazing tabla players right. um, through the experience. Yeah. And I mean, it is a, it, this is uh, a it's a brilliant work of art. There is a reason why it's okay. getting performed as, as much as it is, because it is really a brilliant work of art. And actually hearing you describe that, it's funny listening to it. You do actually feel the journey you're taking us on in terms of, you know, this is this is I, I can identify that as tabla mm -hmm. and then and then the accompanying sound and then something new. Mm -hmm. And different, mm -hmm. um, and modern, uh, like uh, taking 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 these these two things, colliding them for all the better, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is fascinating. And and it was really also interesting because uh, I remember when we first started talking about it and bringing Sean Medvedsky on to do this project, mm -hmm. um, because it, it's challenging for tabla players. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Sean actually is uh, the I think the only soloist, and there are about five soloists now who play this piece, who reads Western notation. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a tabla part in Western notation, which Sean learned in a second. But I've been in situations where I've had to teach people like orally, you know, um, over the phone, right. and then you know create uh, different kinds of notation for them. Yeah. So it's the piece has been a hilarious uh, learning experience for me in so many different ways. You know, just like even mediating discussions between the tabla player and the conductor yeah. has been hilarious. Right. You know. 
Um, so it really was, uh, it really taught me a lot about what it means to sort of balance cultures. Well, and, and, and yeah. you know, fascinating because you are balancing cultures as the composer. Mm -hmm. And then the soloist is also then balancing cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in different ways, each of them, because they each bring something different to it. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm b trying to balance cultures in my life, yeah. you know. And I did an interview with um, someone for this show, I think, last week. And I said, uh, you know, and I've said this before, like not a day goes by when I don't feel either fully Eastern or fully Western, right? right? And I think one of the things music uh, and art um, can give you is the opportunity to find a balance that eludes you in, in daily life. Yeah. You know, you can capture in a bottle the balance that you seek, yeah. right? And I think you can do this as a listener too, yeah. right? That's what music does for you. Yeah, and and and... A listener, and and you know, as a music community, it is fantastic to see to see uh, orchestras embrace this piece because it's it's not it's not the same as booking a regular a regular <laughs> concerto. You know, y y it's it's. Um, I was really thrilled when I re I remember reaching out to you and and saying we want to do this piece and and hinting that we'd like you to come and do it because I wasn't sure and I was, and then you were like yes I would love to and I was like okay perfect um, because you know a lot of a lot of. Um, a lot of times when you book a concerto, usually the, the artist has done it a million times, even the orchestra has done it a lot, or it's full of excerpts, or it's, you know, the, this is this is so wonderful to see orchestras embracing it because it does, it, it forces them to to explore the, the, the uh, that duality of, of cultures and also, you know, forces them, not, not all orchestras are like the SSO, not all orchestras do a lot of 21st century music. Mm -hmm. um, they should all do more. Um, and as I tell my colleagues regularly, and and this forces them outside their own comfort zone, mm -hmm. which is which is fantastic. Now, listening to the players, I know my musicians have loved learning this piece, loved it. That the feedback we've had more positive feedback about them with this piece than I think anything else this season. Yeah, um, uh, so so it, you must find that when you do it, that it is such a wonderful experience each and every time, and uh. new. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, a conductor can't usually tell in the first few <laughs> rehearsals <laughs> if people Takes like the days. music. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta get through the the le the learning processes yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it must, it must be very cool for you when you when you do get to do it. In that, in that, it is a, it is a, it 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 really does kind of push people outside of their um, out of their regular rehearsals and their regular mm -hmm. performances and and gives them something new. You have achieved a lot of that in a lot of your music, though, um, uh, because your music um, is distinct. I, I, it's funny. You're listening to CBC Radio, uh, and, and God bless uh, Tom and Julie, because they play a lot of Canadian music. I can, I can instantly, if I'm not paying attention, I can hear your music and go, oh, I know who that is, um, because you have a distinct voice. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, it's it's not all composers these days do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's been true in every <laughs> in every set of musical history ever. It, it's the thing you work the hardest on. Yeah. I think every person who's trying to write music, that's the question they're obsessed about. Yeah. It it can drive you nuts. And you how know? did you find it? You d I mean, you know, and now I have this discussion with my students, right? Like you 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 typically. Um, uh, you know, I had a fantastic teacher in the UK, and I remember the moment uh, when he said, and I was probably about 21, and he said, you know, it'll be about 10 years until you begin to find your voice. And I went, wait, what? You know, because, <laughs> because he was making the point that the learning curve for the composer is just so slow, whereas, like, your best friend who's playing violin is already playing gigs, and, yep. you know, they've found that sound, yep. right? Yep. And so uh, it just, it you know, it's a combination of just technique happening unfolding very slowly yeah. and life experience and yeah. that kind of thing and and now that you have that do you do you find that you are able to rely on that or is yes. it still a challenge yes i feel i feel blessed well i mean you good. know because because y you work so hard on technique and then then you then you uh, you know then you achieve a certain kind of assurance mm -hmm. and then it becomes a very interesting different problem mm -hmm. right now it's about not repeating yourself, right. right? As you as you move from piece to piece, right. you've you've got your sort of quote unquote sound, uh, which evolves as your life evolves. Yep. But then, what you want to do is trying to try to make each project fresh, yep. uh, and interesting in a hopefully a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have done uh, some incredible. I mean, with Keenan, with um, with Twerk, 
Mm-hmm. You, you, uh, the project you've done with Torque is is incredible. That 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 and 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 different again. I mean, you're writing for for uh, how many? F- there's four of these or four in Torque. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, percussion ensemble. Uh, where do you uh, are these opportunities that just fall in your lap, or do you just seek them out? Um, I have a. That's a very good question. I believe. Um, that the universe brings the right project to me at the right time. And so now I actually don't, it's funny, I don't go chasing after them. Right. I just kind of wait for the signs. Right. And um, because it's a lo- uh, it's just, I, 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 I do think very carefully about the people I'm collaborating with. Right. And it, because it's all about people. Yeah. And I think if you, if you really resonate with people, yeah. it just ends, it just works out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And do you, with your composition, I mean, you, 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 I'm, I, I'm going to ask this question. I ask it of most composers. You treat it like a job? Very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, bec- and, and I think that's something that, um, you know, a lot of non musical people or people who don't get to work with composers a lot assume, you know, you're, you're, you're Mozart and when the, and then when the inspiration strikes, you run to the keyboard. No, no that's, that's no, not no. how it works. Yeah. First of all, I wish I had his level of inspiration. And then, and, and you've just got to compartmentalize, you know, and now my wife and I have a one year old. And so it's like, you know, you just, you just have to, like, when the clock starts and you've got an hour, <laughs> right, you just got to go at it. Yeah. And yeah. do you work towards deadlines? Or do you, do you like, I, I, I know some composers who, the closer the deadline gets, the more inspired they get. No, no, no. <laughs> I actually, no, I have to really pace myself. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm fairly good at, like, I see the deadline and I know how hard I have to work and how I spread it out. Uh, and and yeah, um, but but it's all about building systems yeah. that 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 work. And now you get to teach composition to students. I do. I actually so so I I have a uh, I moved to Ottawa because I got a professorship at the university, and it ended up being for conducting. Right. So so if I have sort of hours left, they yes. give me some composition students. But I also teach in the summer at yeah. the Lunenberg Academy. Yeah. And what yeah. is it like to teach that now? Are you finding yourself saying to the twenty-one-year-olds, "Don't worry, you've got ten more years"? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, it's 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 interesting because it's it's a difficult thing to teach yeah. because it's very nebulous, yeah. right? Like it, it's much easier to teach piano or conducting, I find, because because it's so mechanical and you right. can say you do this and you do that, and um, but with composition, what I find fascinating now uh, is is sort of breaking down all of the components, including the psychological ones. Like, what is the mindset of, uh, you know, what is your mindset when the process works yeah. versus what is your mindset on those days where you just, where you're tearing your hair out, yeah. right? And then, like, so can you, uh, ca- can you optimize that? Right. I think, uh, you know, so it, it's a very sort of sports psychology thing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I always think, well, no one taught that to us, yeah. right? But but in all these other industries, they're really analyzing the heck out of this, yes. and so so that really fascinates me. And and taking a lot of creative ideas from other industries, mm-hmm. I, I have to say mostly from everything else except music, right, is now useful to me. Um, and so I like talking about that. Um, it's fascinating you bring up the, the sports psychology. I mean that that uh, you know we we have sports psychology to thank for Barbara Hannigan. Mm-hmm, um, because exactly. because you know they're the, uh, one of the great artists alive today, um, mm-hmm. and and one of the most creative brains on the planet, who s- who really struggled with with and still struggles with stage fright, uh, with with deep anxiety about live performance, and and began working with with a with a, a, a very important sports psychologist in Holland, yeah. and and that changed her life, and yeah. and she went from being you know I'm a good singer to Oh, and I actually also conduct. Oh, yeah, and I direct, and I do all these things, and yeah. I come up with these creative projects. Oh, and I'll conduct and sing at the same time. Yeah. Um, and without that, I, I, g- I got to do some work with Barbara last year. I mean, she still s- she still struggles with stage fright. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we I, I got to do something with her in Gothenburg last year. She was performing uh, Brett Dean's and Once I Played Ophelia, and she was, I mean, a bit of a wreck during rehearsal. Right. And walked out on stage for the concert and gave as as she called it her her best performance ever of that piece. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It is amazing. And and Johannes Moser the cellist talks about sports psychology really affecting him as well. Mm-hmm. It, it we don't teach it. No. We don't talk about it. We we no. we train people to play their instruments and and stay in their lane. Yeah. And then throw them into the industry. Yeah. <laughs> and we have not prepared them for it. 
exactly. And now I, I really think, I mean, creativity is now the commodity that every young person is going to need absolutely. In every career? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, there'll be a time where, you know, it'll be so easy to search for something that anything you can Google is just is, is pointless to keep in your head, mm -hmm. right? So, so then what skill do you have? And that is your ability to 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 come up with new content and to to create a unique perspective, yep. and and you're only going to be able to do that if you're able to sort of intersectionalize and pull things from different places, yep. you know. Well, and uh, particularly in, in a in a world with Chat GTP, yeah, uh, you know, we a we actually um, had we we used AI to write a blog post earlier this winter because it was you know let's see yeah. how will it do oh and yeah and it was and actually pretty yeah, good it was pretty yeah. good <laughs> it was a bit dull but it was yeah. pretty good and <laughs> it took us no time yeah. um so that creativity is going to change change the world because we do have to be smarter than google yeah hopefully yeah you i mean you as i said you pull double duty you 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 you're leading a dual life this weekend because you're on the podium What's it like to, um, uh, you know, conceive of these programs? I remember our, our, our first email and then our phone call, and it was quite a, quite a lengthy phone call about not wanting to do Scheherazade. And then, and then last year when we were like, okay, let's do this concert, let's redo this concert, and you're like, I want to do Scheherazade. Yeah. What's it like, um, you know, are you, is, that, is that composer or conductor, or is it always both uh. making those decisions? Um, you, you mean uh, particularly about Shehrazad? Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of a funny story because I think when we spoke and it was uh, it was in the pandemic, it, it the the public concerto was was actually being programmed a lot and live streamed during the pandemic. And the funny thing was, all these conductors were pairing it with Shehrazad, and I had this I had this reaction where I was thinking, oh, you're just doing that because of the whole East West thing, you know, and no, you know, and and so I went through this phase. Um, and and I think that's when we spoke. Yeah. And then I said, no, absolutely not, <laughs> you know. And and now I just think, oh gosh, I love that piece. Yeah. I just love that piece. And and so I think you know it's important to have the discussion about why people might call it a quote unquote orientalist piece, mm -hmm. um, and then and then pair it with a tabla concerto, which is you know written in our time, um, where the creator would be someone specifically from the place, yeah. you know. Or, or that region, um, so th so that's been an interesting internal yeah. internal journey. Well, and it also allows. I mean, th we have to have a bigger discussion than simply uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Absolutely. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who who feel that this is one of those pieces that is full of cultural appropriation, so therefore it should just be gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible piece of music. Oh, it is. And and with with all of the faults that we might see about it through its mo through our modern lens mm -hmm. um you cannot take away from it that it is one of the great works for orchestra yeah and so um i loved i loved that discussion we first had on it and i loved the follow up discussion because yeah. it's like whoa okay here we go we're going the other way great yeah. perfect um what 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 what's curious now about about pairing them? Like what what do you actually find curious in that pairing? I I think it's it's just worth uh, speaking to the audience about the context around the piece, right? And uh, you know I have to say like I don't think about cultural appropriation when I hear that piece because you know I I don't hear right. elements like that. But uh, th there are two interesting things about that piece. So the f the first thing is the uh, orientalist perspective, which is that it does fall into a category where the sort of um, the East was being exoticized, and and um, you know it is it is the exotic other, right? Um, and 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 so you 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 have to understand that in the context of uh, its time, and uh, you know uh, Rimsky Korsakov was a Russian composer who was really interested in developing a Russian sound because he wanted to differentiate Russian music from uh, European music, right? And then, and at the time, Russia were, was expanding, so it was actually close to um, the countries with, with uh, sort of Asian influences. And so that was sort of uh, influencing him. But beyond that, I you know, short of going inside his head, you right. don't know exactly, right? right. Um, so... You know, and then and then it's a depiction of the stories from the Arabian Nights, 
and and then there is this uh, aspect of of the story which we would not uh, tell these days, which is you know, I mean it's a, it's a story about how Shahrazad staves off her own death uh, at the hands of this uh, sultan, who is who is you know um, uh, sleeping with a new bride every night and then executing them and that kind of thing and and you know and um, people used to laugh about this and trivia trivialize this, but right. you know you're you're secretly hoping that the that the piece will have a different ending and he'll end up you know. In a in a jail cell with you know I don't know Harvey Weinstein or something like right, that. Right. So uh, <laughs> so so it's important to know that like we wouldn't like we we just wouldn't tell stories the yeah. same way because thankfully we're more sensitive. Yeah. Um, and and so it's so it's that that aspect fascinates me, and and the fact that um, you know it was uh, that you have to understand that people were trying to create this sort of sense of mystery mm -hmm. about places that they um, they didn't understand or something. Um, and and you're balancing that with the fact that it is sonically and aesthetically an exquisite piece of music. Yeah. Well, and and you know, I mean, even Rimsky Korsakov, I, I, I know that they keep there are titles for the movements, but then he he kind of got rid of them. He didn't want because he wasn't telling specific stories from the one, the one thousand or yeah, one thousand and one nights. Exactly. He he was he was he was painting a picture yep. much bigger than 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 tiny little storytelling. Exactly. And 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 so. You know, even he himself was walking away from what it sort of became famous for. Exactly, and he didn't want it to be too on the nose. And I think compositionally, that was a really savvy choice mm -hmm. because you can't even go to the stories and say, "Oh well, this moment in this is is this and that." Um, so what he's trying to do is he, I, I think, what he does very successfully is that he leaves, uh, he gives you just a bit of a clue, and then he leaves a lot of space for your mind to go yeah. and and create images or or whatever. Um, I, I think that was very and very and, clever. and I mean musically it is it's genius. I mean Rimsky Korsakov is one of the great Russian composers and yeah. w and and one of the great orchestrators. Yeah, and knew how to paint with color in an orchestra fascinatingly well. Oh yeah. Um, and and every composer will tell you that this piece they wish they'd written like exactly. every you know like so I conducted and I'm like Don why didn't I think I of that? Written that yeah one. yeah it and and it and it you know I mean it, it the other th thing that musically it's Spectacular! It, it does take the listener somewhere exotic. It doesn't. It, it it's it's not as you say. Like um, some of the pieces that are that are very uh, you could you could point the cultural appropriation finger at. This mm -hmm. doesn't have those. I, I don't hear it. He's not he's yeah. not ripping something off. I don't hear it the way y you know you you hear some pieces from the eighteen hundreds where they were trying to do that, and then you hear a phrase, and sometimes it makes you cringe. I, I don't hear any of that no. here. No, he's writing. Yeah. He's writing with a bigger, fuller palette, with his yeah. own, with his own. And you know, I think, I think, he also, it's a showcase for the orchestra. Almost everybody gets a solo at some point. Yeah. Holy goodness. Yeah. Um. So it, you know, he really, he really put together a great piece of music. Yeah. That musicians love, but so do audiences. And at the end of the day, we were before th before we started tonight, we were talking about the importance of relevance. And uh, audiences still love this piece because it is still relevant. Yeah, the musically, it still takes them somewhere, mm -hmm. and and um, and I think that's one of the geniuses about about this piece. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can appreciate it on, on, excuse me, on so many different levels, yeah. right? Like you can hear it musically, and it makes sense, and yeah, yeah, and and it and it it still today. I mean, you know, not all of Rimsky's Korsakov's music is uh, is you know, I'm I'm not I'm not spinning all the music on the. On the iTunes, a Apple, Apple Classical, whatever it is now, but uh, you know, some of it doesn't have that. So this still has impact. Yeah. Every single time I listen to it, I, when, when you emailed, said, "Nope, let's do it with Shares Head," yeah. I went, "Okay." Yeah. And it's one of those pieces I hadn't listened to in forever, and I turned yeah. it on and went, "Oh God, yeah." Oh yeah. It's it's so. What what do you hope the audience takes away from this weekend? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I just hope that they enjoy all of the music. And they can find things in the music that they, um, you know, um, I, I, I just hope that they can discover things in both pieces that uh, uh, are, are new to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think music is theater as well. I, I you know, if you, if you aspire to writing a piece like Scheherazade, you hear the theatricality of it. And I think that's another special thing about music, that yeah. it sort of transcends sound. It just becomes theater, right? Yeah. 
Um, and I, I hope people enjoy that too. That's amazing. Um, one of the questions that came in from online was that, you know, there are artists out there who can't listen to their own music or their own performances. How the heck do you conduct it? Um, Does it bother you? No, no. I mean, I think, you know, the stuff you like gets better with age and the, st and the stuff you haven't done well, like you just start to then just like Still push program. it aside. Yeah. No. And, 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 but then you're, but, but, but you're just, um, in the moment, you're just kind of, uh, concerned about, you know, how to bring it off the page. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause there are, I mean, there are a lot of composers who, who don't, and, and a lot of artists, I know a lot of, a lot of, uh, very famous touring guest artists who have never heard some of their own recordings mm -hmm. cause they just can't. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a fascinating, a fascinating thing. Are there any questions from the floor? Yash has a question. Yash, go ahead. I'm going to repeat the question. The question was, uh, you know, when you're trying to find your own voice musically and frankly in all things, uh, there's there's two ways to go about it: uh, thinking, focusing, uh, quality, and quantity, output, and and eventually putting out enough music that you you do find your own voice. What what are, what do you what do you think of the what's most important for what's that your process? That's a that's a fantastic question. I I think really thinking consciously about the input is is vital, right? And so I think, you know, it's particularly interesting now because we live in an increasingly globalized world. And uh, people will always tell you that they have multiple identities. And I don't just mean culturally, right? Uh, you know, that th 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 so in a sense that there it's that moment in your life where you realize that your identity is more than just one thing, right? And then if you're making art uh, or you're making content and you're trying to define it, that becomes very interesting because then you just think, oh well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to now pull, uh, create something that is hopefully greater than the sum of its parts from multiple sources, right? So I think it's important to really think consciously about um, what the input is and what your experience is and where you're coming from and, and where you want to go um, and, and really sort of strategize about um, what you want to say. And, and then, so, so essentially then there's a, there is a subconscious, th there is a conscious part of considering all the components that are go going into that input and life experience. Mm -hmm. And then there is a trust that comes with the subconscious part which is that if you just continue uh, to create the output, um, that you know your voice will emerge. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, one of the questions that came in from online, which I think is quite adorable, now that you do have a one-year-old at home, mm -hmm. um, uh, are we going to expect a children's album anytime soon, a or are you now listening to kids' music uh, a lot? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, it's funny. I grew up in a household where, I mean. Yes, we had the Raffi album. We had the Anne Marie uh, Hippo and Hippopotamus in my bathtub. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, my I, I also remember when I first heard Wagner, um, right. and you know, my dad took me to see John Vickers sing when I was four. You know, like uh, so, I I understand that children in musical households have different uh, different musical experiences. Right. Well, we're trying to expose her to sort of lots of different things. So she's exposed me to Raffi. Um, and I didn't know about Rafi, right? Because yeah. uh, I, di I didn't grow up in Canada. So much fun. Yeah, fantastic. And and at the same time, now I think her, her latest party trick is if you say, are you going to conduct, she'll sort of like wave her arms like this because she's been hearing me practice Scheherazade and <laughs> other things. Exactly. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Training a little, a little conductor right from, from ground exactly. zero. That's yeah. nice. Um, do you learn things about your music when you conduct it? Like, do you learn new things as uh, and go, oh, that was really good. Good on me. I or, I do or do you hear the parts you wish you oh could change? Yeah, that one. Yeah, okay. what he said. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and do you go back and make changes? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 It was funny. We had uh, right before the pandemic, we had uh, Rebecca Dale here. We did her the North American premiere of her uh, Maternal Requiem. She flew over last minute for it from England, and and I was sitting with her during rehearsal, and I it was, there was one of the movements had just finished at in dress rehearsal, and I turned to her and said. That's some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard. And she went, oh, God, it's drivel. Oh. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to go home and rewrite it. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So I can imagine conducting it, you go, oh, what the hell was I doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? I know we've got one more from online, which is, is there a dream musician or instrument that you've yet to collaborate with? Mm. You um. are a great collaborator. I mean, you're, you're a phenomenal collaborative pianist. Um, uh, so that makes you, uh, as a musician, uh, speaking on behalf of collaborative pianists everywhere, it, it, it's different. You yeah. learn to have a relationship in a different oh way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean so I, I, it would be, uh, yeah, difficult to sort of, there are so many people, you know. I, 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 f I feel like, you know, one is just short of time. And and you know because because like I said you 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 s you want to spend a lot of time thinking about what you want to say, that every project tends to now take longer, right? <laughs> That's fair. Dinuk, thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled pleasure. that you're here to have your first time on the podium with us. Thank I you. look forward to having you back in the future. And you can see Dinuk in action with the SSO this weekend live at TCU Place or online at ConcertStream.tv. A huge thank you to everyone watching at home, for everybody here, and for everyone at McNally Robinson who helped us out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.